welcome everybody to the uh, presumably first slot for you of uh, real content. Apologize for the small pun, but it had to be. Okay, so welcome. What does a CPU do before uh, going to work? That's what I'm going to talk about, and especially in an embedded system where we will have some variations on of embedded system on the scale. First, my name is Joseph Joseph Hofmar. Um, I'm serving as head of developer relations for Mender.io, which is an OK solution for embedded Linux systems. This is what I do for a living. So whenever you either want to update your stuff, or you want to talk about updating, or you just want to um, ask me not about being called Brooks, then you just hit me up. Um, beyond that, I have a real strong background in the Yocto project, which actually uh, led up to this position. Um, I'm Yocto Project Ambassador, I run a lot of uh, social media for the Yocto Project, I'm involved with Open uh, Embedded. So you can see me on uh, many occasions in the Embedded Linux ecosystem. And completely unrelated, I also am a so-called community hero for Git.io, um, which is like the code on steroids in your browser, and I like it. I'm really, really easy to approach. Um, as you are all here in person, except the ones that are not here in person, um, just walk up to me and say hello, or whatever COVID distance you prefer, I'm fine with that. everything. Shoot me a mail, ping me on Twitter, whatever you uh, find, I'm happy to talk to each and everybody of you. So, with that out of the way, let's get to the good stuff. Um, we have talked about me, now I want to know a little bit about you. Um, I, lovely lady in the back, I actually forgot your name. It's okay. Christy. Christy. Okay, Christy. Because this is the first interactive part. I know, I want to know a little bit about you. Which means, um, the people who are joining remote, if any, they are hereby invited to, like, make some reaction, enter something into the chat, let us smiley flow, whatever that thing supports, when I ask things. So, the first question here is, who in the room or the virtual audience considers themselves a hardware developer? One local? No remote? We've got like a 30 second mm -hmm. lag, so... Okay, maybe oh, that, that, that's no fun. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I will pretend that the, that the virtual audience is just so like here, which means that we probably have like 200 developers. Okay, that's not that yeah, yeah, Who considers themselves a software developer? Yeah, yeah. Woo! Lots of software. Okay, who considers themselves an embedded Linux developer? Vast majority, who considers themselves an RTS or bare metal developer? Not at all. Oh, cool. Then we actually might have some learning activity for you because a lot of this stuff is not about embedded Linux. This is how this presentation would work. I already said to Christy, I am highly interactive. You might have noticed. And I encourage my audience to interact with me. And I know people don't need uh, kicks. They sometimes need kicks, but what even works better is um, rewards. And I reward interaction. Which means that anybody who interacts with me in some form, whatever, you can come up here and hug me, if you so wish. You can propose to me, you can say that I'm an idiot, that whatever I say is completely wrong, you can, you can just stand up and clap, everything. Whatever you do to make this session here more interactive is Even rewarded by me session. with chocolates delivered usually by airmail um, <laughs> until I run out of them. Then you have, then you have to do without rewards. Christy, unfortunately, this does not work for you because you represent too many. So you, I'll, I'll try to get you one as, as a, like a representative for the rest of, of the workshops, okay? I will shall gladly we, eat it. Shall, shall we do this? What, yes. what does the audience say? Oh, you may not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I heard, oh, you may not. But if you want to come. It happens. It happens. Okay, so, you have noticed my talks are somewhat entertaining, hopefully, or cheesy, feel free to pay. Okay, so what will not be in this talk? x86. If you expect anything on, on x86, you are invited to, to stay for the show, but not for the content. If you want content, you better leave now, because it's just not here. What also will not be in here is boot time optimization, because it's a, it's a running joke that at every proper ELC, there is at least one boot time optimization talk, and it effectively consists of two things. 
put everything into modules, and this is a blueprint K. So, see, we've, we've covered boot time optimization. There will be nothing more of this in this talk. Um, there also will not be any code, snippets, blueprint, whatever, that you can apply directly to your code, because we're talking about concepts here. Once you have understood the concepts, then you are able to find the code that matches your problem. But if you have no clue what your problem actually is and the concepts that you have to tackle, then you end up copying, pasting random snippets from Stack Overflow and complaining because they don't work, because you haven't understood what you understood, what you are actually looking at. And last but not least, um, very specific and complicated things like NVIDIA Tegra or um, the, the presentation on the AM6 whatever by TI, which has like a gazillion boot stages and stuff like that, uh, also will not be in here. We are, again, covering generic concepts. So, what will be in this presentation now? The real low-level stuff, what the CPU does before going to work. And we will, at some points, actually go down to the real electrical kind. So, things that affect booting that you will be able to see on the circuit board. We will have a little bit of historical background, hopefully, and we will have a metaphor, a mental image, that hopefully serves well enough for you to understand where the stages actually fit in. My colleagues said it's okay, others said it's super cheesy, I, I, I kind of like it. Okay, because it will work like that, I tried to be a wannabe Randall Munro, I got myself a tablet, I scribbled some things, uh, so I, I pretend this is like XKCD. It actually is not, probably, because the quality of art is much worse, but hey, it makes me feel good. So this is, this is what will be used to visualize everything. And here comes the real content. All of you, what do you do before going to work? Sleep and wake up. That's, that's... I <laughs> Sleep and wake up and eat. Okay, I, uh, I actually only realized that, that somebody here sleeps, somebody here wakes up, and uh, I forgot. Uh, you did take breakfast, right? Okay, so we pretend that we are a CPU now. And a CPU, when you switch it on, it effectively becomes somewhere from sleep. It wakes up in its bed, and then what it does? Yeah, what actions do you need to take, and what actions does the CPU need to take? Stage one the real dirt as cheap flash microcontroller. What does it do when it wakes up? Usually those have a couple of K up to a couple of hundred K NOR flash, NOR flash is important, um, included. And when such a system puts up, when it gets power, it actually does one thing. It looks at the flash at a specific point, which I'll get to in a second, and then it just runs whatever is there. That's it. There usually is some minimal ROM loader included, which you need to actually get things into that flash. But beyond that, it does nothing. It's, it's completely dumb. Power on, do something. That's it. Examples for this, contemporary ARM M0, M0+, plus, stuff like that, the ESPs, and basically any proprietary small microcontroller. If it has uh, on-chip flash, behaves roughly like this. The metaphor is this. You stay in your bed all of your life and you have a laptop. You wake up, you start working until you like power off and the next day you wake up, you start, just start working again. This is the life of a microcontroller. Home office to the extreme. What does this technically mean? And that's why I said NOR flash. NOR flash is usually connected via a full uh, bus with, which means it can be directly accessed at any address. It comes directly into the address space that your CPU can see. So the arrow is, is, uh, is here is the uh, like program counter or where the CPU looks at first. And this is how, how your microcontroller sees the world. You power it on, it looks at one point and then it just executes whatever is in the flash. Those usually have almost no initialization, a little bit of GPIO, usually one, one tick to base things off, 
usually, but sometimes not even that. Peripherals, only the bigger ones. Yeah, that's it. That's really the, the absolute bare minimum what a CPU can ever do to get to work. Then we enter stage two. We, we are staying with memory because I said, the small microcontrollers, they have like a couple of K to a couple of hundred K of RAM, uh, of, of NOR. Once you start adding stuff, and especially like HMI stuff, uh, a graphical display or whatever, you need, you need more memory because you will have graphical assets that have to go somewhere. Or if you um, have uh, network connections, if you have um, connect, added connectivity, your, your software grows. It just doesn't fit in there anymore. So you start adding external flash. This means the CPU has now, now needs to know how to actually get stuff from that external flash because um, they are very, very similar. It's again, it's a full width connection, but there's variations. And depending on your, your pinout, we, we come to the elect electrical kind here now, you might want to connect it over eight bits with 16 bits how, may, uh, how, how are the upper and lower bytes addressed and everything that the CPU needs to know that in order to actually be able to boot. And how do, we, do I tell this to a microcontroller? If there's, there's nothing that even runs there, um, we use pins usually. Who of you has heard the, uh, the term uh, pull ups and pull downs? Who of you can actually explain what it is? Okay, <laughs> I actually had help no more. So, first big le learning experience here now. Um, a pin on a CPU should have a defined state. Either it is high or it is low. And this is the magic that happens here. To tell the CPU things really, really early during boot booting, it looks at the pin state because that's the only thing that you have. How do I tell something to a pin state? I add a resistor that connects the pin to either high, means uh, VCC, or ground. So I can, per pin, I, give, I can give the CPU one bit of information, one or zero. Is that, is that clear as a way to pass information? I take that as a yes. So why pull up and pull down? The pulling is clear, it pulls the pin to either high or low. But why a resistor? Because it would be really, really wasteful if you couldn't use that pin for anything else after booting. That would be an expensive way to pass information in. Therefore, you add a resistor, which is usually in the 10K or 100K ohm range, which means this limits the current that actually flows in and out of the pin. And once the CPU is properly booted, the pin, if it's an output or whatever per other peripheral that you have, usually can supply a lot more current than this tiny pull up and down, so it's just easily overridden. This is, we are talking about an initial state that only serves for the first couple of milliseconds, usually as when the CPU powers up. And after that, the pull ups are completely overridden. And the, the bigger the, the resistor's value is, the smaller the current that flows through it. I told you, we are talking about electrics. And yes, this, this is stage two. We, add, uh, we usually add pull-ups and pull-downs to pass information into the microcontroller to tell it how the external memory actually looks like. And once the, um, the, C uh, the microcontroller has found that external memory, it just works like stage one. It looks at a specific address and executes whatever is there. Examples for this are the higher um, performance microcontrollers. I've personally done a lot of this on uh, Cortex M3s. I know that Cortex M4s can do the uh, pretty much same thing. If you're looking at Risk V, then the Kendrite is uh, pretty much like this. But again, a lot of the bigger um, uh, proprietary microcontrollers behave just the same. The analogy, you actually get out of bed, but not that far. You have to make it from your bed to your desk. And 
analogy are that the pull-ups and pull-downs are basically like a handrail. You fall out of your bed and you grab the rail and it tells you where your desk is. And you walk along the handrail until you find your desk and you sit down and then you can finally work. But at least a little brain is involved grabbing the handrail. Was there a question somewhere? No, okay. Technically, it's really like on stage one, and we have already talked about pin state. To visualize, it's external to the CPU, and depending on how it's connected, you get it in there. Stage three, now we are talking about software. And remember, we are still in microcontroller land. A microcontroller that has a bootloader usually means that you have one small and one big um, application. You put your first application at the point of flash where things are um, executed, as I pointed out in stage one and stage two. This bootloader that is usually very, very propri proprietary because you made it for your use case, it can initialize additional memories, it can check if there's a real application loaded somewhere again, or it can help you with getting the application in there. It can also help you with board bring up. That's a classic use case to have some really initial debugging functionality in there. And what does this mean now, I would say? We are getting more towards real life. You get out of bed, and then you at least do something to get you in shape for, for real uh, work. I think breakfast serves as a, as a, as a good thing. But you see, these, these are two tables, and the tables look the same. Because to the CPU, it actually is the same. The CPU does not distinguish if, if something is a bootloader or, or is an application. These are just two programs that are linked to different places in, in your memory. The CPU, again, starts out a specific place. The bootloader does its thing. And once the bootloader decides, wow, well, cool, booting is finished, we've got to do something else, then it just takes the arrow, puts it somewhere else, so the, so the uh, microcontroller knows where to continue running, and then the application goes on. That's it. This is how a bootloader on a microcontroller works. You link to two different locations and you just manipulate the program counter. I think we have covered enough gory details of um, microcontrollers by now, because about everything that I told you so far basically applies to bare metal stuff. And bare metal here means that is stuff that really runs directly on the CPU. You, you can see all of the registers. You can see all of the peripherals. You can, you can do everything. What does, you have no higher libraries usually. And what, the, what does that mean? This is just like you in, in your home office. If you are in your home office, you're king of the hill. In your flat, you can do whatever you want. You, you can have video calls with no pants on. Nobody will care. You, you can work from your bathtub as long as you don't care, uh, put on uh, the camera. Nobody cares. If you get your stuff done at home, everybody's fine. This is how microcontrollers think of the world. But sometimes, and depending on your profession, you might need more advanced tooling. You might need a milling machine. Or if you're working in electronics, you, you might need pick and place machines, uh, surface mounted device reflow stuff. Usually you don't have that at home. Usually you have that at, at your company somewhere. So this is where we are stepping up one big notch. We are stepping up to stage four to microprocessors. My personal rule of thumb, everybody here is invited to disagree. My personal rule of thumb is I call it a microprocessor once an MMU is involved and used. There are like minor protection-ish things on some microcontrollers too. But if you ask me, they're just a pain to use and nobody does that. So in the end, it's, it's just, again, like a microcontroller. Once you're running something that really uses memory protection, I personally tend to call it an operating system. And here, things change 
pretty much. Because it's, it's much less um, a custom thing than their bootloaders, especially, or the, the operating system as a whole, and also the bootloaders turn much more into a commodity than they are on your microcontroller. Who of you knows of a bootloader they can download for an Cortex-M0? How many of you know of a bootloader that, that you can use for a Cortex-A8? See, that's what I mean. The rest of you certainly know one too, you just didn't make the link here. Because, for example, U-Boot. Who has heard of U-Boot? See, that's a commodity bootloader. It needs some minor patching to, or tinkering to work on a specific board or processor, depending on how far it is away from the nearest one that you know. But essentially, it's, it's a thing that is out there and that, the, that you can just use. What does this mean again now for the booting? The bootloader that gets kicked off at the first step is to the microprocessor actually just like a bare metal application. Because why should a bigger MPU do other things or behave completely different than your microcontroller? No, it actually doesn't. Some of you might scream now, but wait for stage five. I've worked on microprocessor units that actually did the real same thing. They had NorFlash somewhere, they booted up, or they started up, they looked at address zero after NorFlash and executed whatever was there. And at the time it happened to be U-Boot. And then U-Boot does whatever you want the bootloader to do. You, um, it usually does quite a bit more than your classic uh, bare metal bootloader. It does memory initialization. It has way more um, driver features. Usually you can also think of the bootloader as a small monolithic OS in itself. It's not, not very fancy to think of it like this, but I feel it's like the truth. And once this smaller OS is happy with, with whatever you're, you're supposed it to do, then it hands off to the bigger OS, which in our case is Linux. And this one gives you the libraries, the middleware, the connectivity, and also the multiprocessing and the separation with the MMU and everything. This is beyond what we do at this moment. Why did I say now I've personally worked on, um, on CPUs that do it that way? Uh, they have become increasingly unpopular for cost reasons. We are going back to electrical kind here. I told you that um, NorFlash is involved if you want the full width, the simple access, and NOR memory is extremely expensive. So if you want to add NOR memory for the sake of simplicity, you pay, I guess, like 100 times the price you pay for NAND memory. Plus, you need like 30 pins to connect it, whereas NAND you can connect on 7, 8 pins, depending on whatever you, you actually uh, use. So this is more a thing of, of the past, and it's still exists for some lower end A5s, A7s, but actually I've used it in the good old ARM 9 days. This is like I see the metaphor here. You get out, out of bed, you do your breakfast, and then you can just like walk over to the company. And in the company, you're under more control. This is the memory management and the protection. You you and your application are not allowed to do whatever you want anymore, but you have access to all the big boys twice. They are at the company, they are in the operating system. What does this mean for the technical details? We already covered most of it. One addition here. Um, again, the, the process starts out at flash zero. And I told you memory initialization and that U-Boot is like a small OS in itself. OSs usually don't like to be executed from, an, from a flash memory just because it's much, much slower than RAM. So U-Boot as a small OS that it is actually initializes your bigger RAM, your SD RAM or DRAM, whatever you, ha you have. Load, so pulls 
the rest of itself through the controller in the RAM and then actually executes it. This is what basically happens. And once it is running there, it is able to pull Linux from whatever else ROM that you have, also put it into RAM, hand off to Linux, and once li Linux is running, it can overwrite you would because you don't need it anymore. Does that make, make sense so far? I know that I'm rambling a lot about memories, but actually, when I prepared this talk and I assembled all the information, I understood that if you want to know what's going on there, you have to understand memory. Because once you have understood how memories relate to the CPU, then you can do all the rest. And then we, we come to the fifth and final stage, what you probably all have witnessed. Um, it's essentially the same, the, the MPUs, but they, we have multi-stage bootloaders these days. They come in a, in a number of varieties and a number of lengths. And the, cl the most prominent one is the, is the so-called SPL. Who has heard the term SPL? Yeah, everybody. And essentially, it, it means that the CPU is just able to find a small bootloader binary somewhere, which is just enough to, again, bring up enough memory to run a full U-boot. Because RAM is external to the CPU. It does not know how to initialize it, usually, how, um, how wide it is, how big it is, what timings it needs. This is stuff that you need to tell it, that you need to put into software. But, and the CPU can't run anything complicated. It usually has like 16K RAM internally. What can you do in 16K? It's not that much. So you have to create a secondary loader I know it's going backwards. Don't blame me for this. I didn't make it up. Um, this secondary lo diary loader uses these few K of RAM to set up the bigger SDRAM, load the real bootloader into the big SDRAM, kick it off. This does its job there and hands off to the, uh, to the actual operating system. This was like the classic booting until five years ago or so. And now, chains have become ever more complicated these days. RISC is adding the open SBI loading, usually, if you're on an OWNAD1 or uh, Unleashed or whatever they have these days. ARM, is ca ARM can load um, Opti or Trusted Firmware somewhere in this process. These are all things that are looped in somewhere between the stages that I just mentioned. I have looked at the at the flow of a Tegra, and it's, it's, it's not a flow, it's a maze. Seriously, it, I think it has like 25 stages and they, there are arrows get going back and forth and colors to indicate which, which component can see which other component. Do you, do you want a cool pose for the photo stage dev? Oh, come on, boring. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the key part here is it's a chain. This is, this is the one thing that I want, I want to convey. Booting is not like um, not like a some a little bit of this and a little bit of that and some and then everything comes together and it magically works. No, booting in almost every case is a chain where each and every step has to be taken, has to be successfully fulfilled, and only then you can you have a usable system. And if you fall over somewhere in the chain, well then sorry, no work for you. Uh, this, like I said, applies to about every uh, contemporary processor that I know of in some variation. The recipes, um, who, who knows the, how, how are they called? Uh, not boot image, but kernel 7 or what, whatever, those, those fancy firmware blobs that you have to have on your SD card in order to actually make it work. It's just like before the SPL there. It's, However your, comp your company or your vendors call it, it's always this in uh, various forms. The metaphor again, all of this happens at home. Some of you might have expected now to, that this all comes in, in, in the company building. No, it does not. 
These are all things that you do at home in bootloaderland before handing off to the actual operating system. And that's why I asked in, in the beginning, I, for example, I get up, I take a shower, I brush my teeth, I sometimes shave, um, I take breakfast, I put on my cowboy uh, boots and all of things. So this can become pretty much contrived. But again, it's a chain. Brushing teeth before having chocolate crispies for breakfast is not exa exactly uh, a good idea. It only makes sense in one order. And this is how booting also works. Um, for, for the sake of completeness, I also created imagery so you can um, visualize what an SPL does. We're not at stage zero here anymore because I mentioned it, now we're usually not using NOR anymore. We more often than not are using NAND memory in whatever form, be it an EMMC, being, be it um, plain NAND memory, be it, be it an SD card, whatever. It's more complex memory that is somewhere. So this is relying quite a bit more on the internal loader, which I pointed out is just intelligent enough to pull the SPL from somewhere. The internal loader goes to ROM, pulls in the SPL, which again, once it is in RAM, gets other stuff from the flash, puts it in RAM, and this goes back and forth and back and forth until all of the stages are completed and your system is hopefully working. What should you take away? Chains, I can't, I can't um, emphasize that enough. Um, the application on the M MCU is what you want to reach or the operating system on the MPU because from, from the point of view of booting, everything that is in the operating system is like the same. You've handed off from your boot process and we don't care anymore. The more complex your CPU is, the more complex your boot chain will be. M0 on the one end, just one reset vector up to, um, up to the stuff like NVIDIA Tegra or AM6, whatever. I think I, I wasn't in that talk, unfortunately, but was somebody of you? How long did he take to explain the, the boot process? Uh, a long time. See what I mean? <laughs> so the more complex and high powered the, the CPUs or your socks become, the more complex the boot chains also tend to be. Um, again, it, the, the later in the boot chain you are, the less hardware specific your boot software will be. The SPL is super specific because it needs to know about the very exact hardware type of SDRAM that you have put onto your board. It needs to know the timings. It needs to know the pinout. It needs to know its size and everything. You boot proper, which it loads, usually doesn't need to know anymore. SDRAM is properly set up, it's living there, it, it works, everything is fine. The later you are, the, the more generic and more high level you can, actually, um, you can actually be. And if support is there in hardware, you can do fancy stuff, but only if it is there in hardware. Your bootloader, just because it is early in, in the process, does not mean it can do magic. So if you are on hardware that does not have an MMU or does not have support for, I always forget the word, sorry, Ross, um, this trusted magic, whatever stuff you can hide from Linux on ARMS and, uh, or SPI on RISC-V, all of the cool kids have something like this those days. If it is not there in hardware, then your bootloader can, can give it to you. Some people think, well, I can, if I just put it into, into U-Boot, I can do it early enough so Linux won't see it. No, once, the, once booting is finished, you, your U-Boot is gone. And Linux is king of the hill unless hardware saves you. Um, why do I talk uh, so much about bootloaders? Because I mentioned it really, really uh, early. We do uh, over the air updates and we care about our updates kicking in really early in the boot process. That's why we know about bootloaders. So, Thank you very much.
If you want to know something about booting, I will try to help. If you want to know something about Mender, I will try to help. If you want to know something about the Octo project, I will try to help. If you want to have a celebration glass of whiskey with me right after this, because I just delivered two presentations in two hotels in two hours, and I'm gonna pretend that I'm awesome. Um, you're all invited, I have something on me. And yeah, with that, I still got chocolates. Try to kill me with your questions. Yes and no. For the sake of this presentation, um, I would say please ask me in 10 minutes. Because even though I'm working for them, this presentation is not on Mender and I prefer to stay true to the developers that attended it for other reasons. Thank you. But you deserve the chocolate. No more questions, then I can make up something? Or, or you, do you want to run for coffee early? If nobody screams bloody murder in the next three, two, one, then I will just keep babbling about how bootloaders are built in the Yakta project because, because that's a common source of pain. And um, one thing that um, you might actually uh, be interested in is that um, while with U-Boot being close to a somewhat de facto standard, um, I also pointed out that is, it is usually patched per board. And good vendors, which I hopefully all of you are either working with or working for, submit their, their stuff upstream. And the not so good and sometimes even bad or evil vendors ship heavily hacked versions of U-Boot uh, along their bills. And then poor souls like me and all my fellows in the Octa project get uh, annoyed by people who be like, oh, this doesn't build anymore, and what, it, it's just this U-Boot, and then we, we look at it, and it's like a vendor version from 2015 or so, 2017, and I kid you not, four weeks ago, I looked at the BSP for an IMX8, so not something ancient, that is currently put in production, and the, the vendor patched their bootloader so badly that it cannot build without Python 2. I have no clue what they did. And seriously, if you work on booting, don't do that. Don't make your users hate you, okay? It's, I, I know it's painful making stuff work and everybody is happy if they're done and it works and then you just try to get it out of, get it off your desk and be, live happily ever after, but please, you have users and you, you want your users to not hate you, okay? If, if that is the one real life thing you take away from this for your Linux careers, then sh this shall be it. With that, I think I have technically two, two minutes left and this is your well-deserved early coffee break then. Thank you, everybody.